Hey, I'm Colby Jubenville, and I'd like to welcome you to the campus of Middle Tennessee State University and the Center for Student Coaching and Success. This is our lecture series, and today we've got Mr. Ben Hamback, who is an author that's going to speak to us about his book. I'd like to thank the Honors College for allowing us to use this great facility today, and the College of Media and Entertainment for allowing us to use your equipment. Uh, ben is, a, is a, business, a great business person in Nashville. He's known for his philanthropic work, and certainly he's going to talk to us about his book, and the title itself is going to be one that intrigues you. Ben, the title of your book is... Never Leave the Locker Room of the Super Bowl. Never Leave the Locker Room of the Super Bowl. When I heard that, I said, hey, first I've got to figure out how you got there, and then second, I've got to understand what the book is about. And, and the book certainly fits in with what our mission is right here in the center. And our mission is to help students become gainfully employed in their chosen career path prior to walking across the stage of graduation. So, Ben, I'd like to welcome you here. Thank you for being here on campus, and thank you for being here Colby, at MTSU. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everybody. How are we doing? Good, good, good. So, um, before I kick things off, I want to get a couple ground rules here, is, is that uh, uh, I'm going to speak for about 35, 45 minutes, um, and then we've allowed some time for questions. But um, I want this to be conversational. So please, if there's a question, if you've got a story to share, or if you have any comments as we go through the presentation, please grab my attention, and I would love to hear it. So uh, before we start, seniors, juniors, what, what are we, uh, freshmen, sophomore? Uh, in the Oh, all graduate students. Okay, great, great. Okay, I just didn't know what the makeup of the makeup of the class was. So, well, again, as Colby mentioned, my name is Ben Handback, and um, I've been in, I've lived here now in Middle Tennessee for over um, 20 years, and have been in the insurance business most of my life. I'll give you a very very quick background and how we came about how I came about here today. Uh, been in the insurance business um, and have um, over time worked my way through with different companies and whatnot. I now work for an organization called Aon. Uh, you, you probably are familiar with Aon if you've seen a Manchester United game, so where we sponsor Man U. So the Aon logo is on the, on the soccer jersey. Uh, we're headquartered in London, U.S. headquarters in Chicago, and I run the Tennessee operation for Aon. Um, I'm the resident managing director. And my responsibilities for Aon is that I have a sales and service office that works with our clients and our prospects in, in, in for, the, for the state of Tennessee. We have 71 offices across the country. Prior to that, I own my own insurance agency, the Handback Group, which I built up from 2013 to 2000 and, um, I'm sorry, 2007 to 2013, and I sold that to Regions Insurance, and then I wound up going to work for Aon. So um, from, the, from that period of time, uh, from 13 to 16, I had an article in the Tennessean, and it, was, it, it ran in the, in the Nashville, Tennessean, the newspaper here, um, from 2013 to 2016, the last Sunday of every month, and it was called Business Focus. And I had different topics. I had customer service. I had um, how to build your business, relationships. Um, just you'll, you'll see some of the topics that we talk about today. And it ran for three years. So I had 36, 36 articles over that three-year period of time. And my friends and family over time had encouraged me to put the articles in one place. They said, These are, this is a really, really great article, and, and we, we really enjoyed it. And so they encouraged me to publish my book. So I took the 36 articles. And, um, and, and put them in the book called Never Leave the Locker Room of the Super Bowl. So that's how we came about with the book. Did you have, did you have a question? Yeah, what type of insurance? So the, yeah, it's a great question. So, so we'll talk a little bit about that today, too. So um, Aon Corporation does every type of insurance you could possibly think of. So right now, the big hot topics for insurance are cyber insurance. And, and how do you ensure, a, like, a breach of, of, your, of your, your data? You know, it could be a Home Depot or a Target or a university. Um, and then also healthcare. You know, obviously with the changes in Obamacare, healthcare is a huge topic, and also a, 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 an area where companies are looking for savings. So, all right. So, I always this is a slide. I've done this uh, presentation for high school students, college students, um, and actually chambers of commerce and some different sales classes. And I always love to start with this um, this this uh, photo because people always ask me like, "What's your book about?" Right? And it's not about diarrhea. But uh, this photo is actually from when my family was on vacation. We were down in Destin, Florida. We get out to the pool, right? We've, we've driven seven hours. We get out to the pool, and we see the sign. It says, do not use the pool if you are ill with diarrhea. And my kids couldn't stop laughing. We took a photo with our camera phone. And so the kids looked at me and said, they're like, Dad, if you're ill with diarrhea, why would you get in the pool, right? They, they couldn't understand why there had to be a sign. And I said, I said hey. I go, you know what, sometimes people need to be reminded, right? 
And that is, that's how I describe my book. There's not going to be anything that we're going to talk about today that's going to be earth shattering. We're not going to be doing algorithms on a crayon marker on a wall. I'm going to talk about some very business basic things. And it's a good reminder of, of, especially to college students, as you start to enter your career, as you're interviewing, as you're looking for a job, and as you're moving forward in your, in your life. So. so today we're going to talk about, I've, I've pulled six chapters of my book, right? And, those, and these are the six topics. So we're going to talk a little bit about relationships. We're going to talk about thanking people, giving back to the community, and giving back to um, your time. We're going to talk about being on time. We're going, to be talk, we're going to talk about making decisions, and I'm going to share some, some things that I've used in my career to make decisions, especially important ones. And then we're going to talk about never leave the locker room of the Super Bowl, and we'll get to that at the end. So one of the things that I'm going to do today, and I'm going to try my very best because I'm, I'm not perfect at it, is, is I'm going to try to use the Gestalt language protocol. Does anybody know what that is? Are you familiar with that or heard that? So I was a member of an organization called Entrepreneur Organization when I owned my own business. And what they did was is they broke you up into forums. So I was in a forum with about six to eight people and we met once a month. And the reason we got together once a month, we all owned our own business. Um, we all were dealing with similar problems and struggles. And we would meet and we would share ideas. We would share problems. Um, we would talk about we would talk about problems that we're having in our business. We could t talk about problems you were having in your personal life. And we had one rule, or I'm sorry, two rules. One was that it was completely confidential. And then the second was is that we used the Gestalt language protocol. And what that is, is that it's experience sharing versus advice, right? So I'm going to, if, if someone comes to me with a problem, instead of me telling them what I think they should do, I'm going to tell a story or share an experience that I think they can learn from and maybe pull a kernel from that experience and then help them move forward. And what that Gestalt language protocol did, especially in, in, in that group of people, is there were never any debates, right? Because I'm not telling you what to do and you're saying no, right? I'm just sharing an experience. There were never any disagreements and there was never con conflicting views because I'm just sharing a story and just telling, telling what I think might work or work for me. And, and it, may, it may or may not work for you. No opinion. No opinion. Well, you, give, you can give your opinion, but you just can't, you can't tell it to the person, right? So um, the other thing is, is that um, someone's going to be more likely to listen to a story, right? You know, it's, we're, we're so much better as human beings when we're storytellers versus when we're giving advice. Um, so today, as we move through this presentation, I am going to try, <laughs> without, without telling you what to do, I'm going to try to tell you what's worked for me. So I'm going to tell that through stories, talk about the book, and hopefully at the end of this, this uh, 45 minutes, you guys will be able to pull some kernels and take it forward with you versus me telling, telling a group of college students this is what you should do. So the first thing we're going to talk about is relationships. Um, I am a huge believer, huge believer, that life has to be seen as a relationship network. And I say that, I mean everything, business, personal, school, family. It is all intertwined. It is a huge relationship network. And the, people can attack this a couple different ways, but the more time and energy and the more care and nurturing that, that I've put into my relationship network, the more it's blossomed for me. I've tried to put myself in the mindset that I will be dealing with everyone that I meet for the rest of my life, right? It's not a handshake and nice to meet you. I look at everyone as they could affect me or I could help them down the road as we continue to grow as business people, as friends, and as family. I truly care about their interests, their family, their hobbies. It's just the way I've treated people and it's the way I've treated my business. Um, and I treat my clients like I would want to be treated. So I'm going to give you a few examples. One of the things that, uh, again, that we did in our entrepreneurial organization was we had something that we called needs and leads. And so as we would meet, we would sit down around the group and we would say, um, we would say, I, I might need, um, I, I'm, there may be need for me for, for a professional accountant. And I have nobody that I know that's an accountant, right? So I'm going to see if that group can help me. I mean, it may be where I just had a great experience with a vendor. Maybe it, maybe it was an accountant, right? I've got a great accountant. They're doing a great job. I'd like to share that. And there's nothing more powerful than going out of, out of your way as a business person to introduce people that could benefit someone else. Because they will always be grateful and they'll always be, be thankful. 
And we found a way as a group to fill business gaps um, with, within our organizations. And it was, it was very powerful. I love this quote by Oprah Winfrey. And it's, uh, it says, lots of people want to ride with you on the limo, but what you want is someone who will take the bus when the limo breaks down, right? And that's just being there for the good times and the bad. And I'm about to be 50, year, 50 years old next month, and I can tell you that there are people that I thought I could count on, and that's in business. And when I speak about this, I'm speaking business and personal, and have truly just disappointed me when the times got really tough, right? And so the key to that is, is as, a, as I look at my relationships and I've tried to b build my relationships, is you've got to be there for the good times and the bad. One of the things in that same vein that I've tried to do is, um, and, and I can't tell you how this has paid off for me over time, is, is that when I have a client or a customer or a friend that either loses their job or is displaced um, or is looking for, for a job, I write an unsolicited recommendation letter to them, put a handwritten note in the mail, and send it to them. So as soon as I found, if I found out that Matt lost his job and I heard it through the internet or heard it through a grapevine or whatever, it, the very first thing I do is I write a recommendation letter, again, unsolicited. Email it to them, send it with a handwritten note in the mail as well, and, and just let them know that, hey, I'm there for you. If there's anything I can do to help, let me know. And it has been one of the most powerful, thing, powerful things that I've done in my career. And, and, and part of it is, is um, number one, it's, it, it comes from the heart and it's sincere because I want to help Matt out, number one. But number two, wherever Matt lands, he's never going to forget that I did that for him. So I had, I'll give you a case in point. I had a very close friend that worked for Red Bull most of his career. Um, lost his job. Red Bull was making changes. They were changing their marketing, and he lost his job. I, I wrote that letter for him. Uh, he got it in the mail. He came over to the house to thank me for, for the letter. And he said, I can't tell you how many people, when they found out I lost my job, ran. I mean, they, they just, they, I, they wouldn't return my phone calls. He goes, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't, you know, they stopped reaching out to me. And he said, I got, a, I got a letter in the mail from you with a recommendation letter on how can I help. And I can't tell you how powerful that is. Um, and then I, I talk about relationships all in a positive manner, but, but um, I also get the question all the time, um, you know, what happens when, when people don't reciprocate, right? What happens when you're, you're going out of your way and doing all these things and, and they don't reciprocate? And so I've got a little bit of a rule with that. And it can, go, it can work with friends, it can work with employees, it can be with, you know, with your teachers or people in your study group, and it's two strikes, right? I mean, I will always give somebody a second chance, right? I mean, if somebody's going to have a bad day or they've eaten a bad burrito or they're, you know, they, they, the pred's lost or whatever, but, but um, you know, it's not baseball. You don't get that third strike, right? We're going to give you two, but then after that, it's, um, it's like, hey, we need, you, might need to think, you might need to think or look inside and say, okay, do I want to spend more time or invest more energy in that relationship? We'll talk about this a little bit more, but you, you guys are going to get a copy of my book. And, and throughout the book, we, we, I mentioned FOBs. And FOBs are friends of Ben. And I'm going to tell a story a little bit later to come back to that. But I got some experience sharing early on, about 20 years ago. And the, the, the gentleman, and we'll, we'll talk about it more in depth later, but the gentleman said, he said, I'm going to tell you what's been so valuable for me. And he said, Ben, I have surrounded myself with four or five people in my life that are that I can trust and that I can count on. And he said, they know, they know all my secrets. They you, know, they, they, they know who I am, they know my family. And he said, there's gonna be a time in your career, in your life, where you're gonna need these people and they will be there for you. And it's, so just, we, I call them the friends of men or FOBs. I, I also liken it to the circle of trust. If you've seen Meet the Parents with Robert De Niro, you know, it's like, he's like the circle of trust. Um, and that group of people that you, that you count on and that you surround yourself with will be invaluable, invaluable as you guys grow as a business person, <clears throat> and, well, just as a person and a, a, a per, personally and professionally. And so I just want you to remember one thing from this, this, this chapter, <laughs> or this section, is that for me, three of the greatest assets or liabilities that I've had in my career have been the personal relationships that I've had with either friends, family, customers, and clients. It's so important. How I've treated them has been so important as I've continued to grow my career. All right, so we're gonna have, we have a little bit of homework. So I, I do, everybody needs a piece of paper and a pencil. It's, it's, not, it's not even that big of a deal, but I do have a little bit of homework that we're, as we go through the presentation. Or you can do it on your phone. So I'd like you to just take a moment and 
um, write down two names for me of um, friends that are close to you. So like we, talk, we just talked about relationships. I'd like, you to talk, I'd like you to tell me or write down or, or make note of two of the most important personal friend relationships that you guys have in your life right now. This also gives me a break to have a sip of water. Nope. Nope. All it is is it's, it's not family and it's not a professional. It has to be a friend. That's the, that's the only criteria. All right, now I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit. I'm going to talk, and you guys, I know college kids are going to and maybe roll their eyes a little bit, but I'm going to talk about the power of a handwritten note. And that's this next section. So anybody, this is, this is the Q&A portion. Can anybody tell me how often the average American gets a handwritten note or letter in the mail? Any idea, any guesses? Once a year. Once a year. One, so, the average American receives a personal letter once every seven weeks, right? Is, has anybody received a handwritten note in, in the past few weeks or the past couple? Yep, and you remember it, right? Yeah. Right, because it was probably the only one you've gotten, right, in the past few weeks, right? Anybody tell me, oh, sorry, anybody tell me how many emails the average corporate account gets in a day. Any idea? So the average corporate email account, so Ben Hanback, my, what, what's the average number of uh, emails that you get in your inbox per day? 20? Colby, any thoughts? <laughs> exactly. All right, the average corporate email account receives more than 100 emails a day, and I personally receive over more, more, more than 200. Now, a lot of, because of the role that I'm in, a lot of them I'm CC'd on, so right, it's not, they're not to me, I'm CC'd and I have to just, I, but I have to make sure I either read it or know what the heck's going on, right? And so you think about that, right? No one's getting handwritten uh, notes in the mail and you're getting 200 emails a day in your inbox. All right, anybody know what the average individual gets text, how many times they text a day? That's my daughter on her phone, by the way, so any, any, any thoughts on how many text messages the average person gets or, and sends and receives a day? I'm sure you guys are texting all the time, right? Yeah, more than text, more than email. Yeah. Yep. So the Americans between the ages of 18 and 39 now send or receive nearly 180 to 200 text messages a day, right? So just we're inundated with our phones, inundated with email technology. So just, just within the past year and a half, the United States Post Office was considering stopping the mail on Saturdays because of budget crisis and because of uh, money problems, right? Because, because all, I mean, when I go to the mailbox now, I mean, I just did it on Saturday. Basically, it's junk mail and bills. I, go to the, I, I walk into the garage, I throw the junk mail away, and I take the bills upstairs, right? I mean, you just, you, you know, don't get, you don't get the notes in the mail. And so what does this tell you? I can promise you what this tells you is that thanking your important relationships with a handwritten note is now more important than ever. I have a good friend, his name is Greg Hatcher, and he was Arkansas Businessman of the Year a few years ago, and he's in the similar business that I am. He's an he's a, um, insurance broker, has his own agency called the Hatcher Agency. Um, he's friends with Bill Clinton and all the, all the, you know, the people. He's, he's been, been just an a, a, a amazing business person in, um, in Arkansas. And he wrote a book called 55 Steps to Outrageous Service. And his quote was, taking time to thank people with a note accomplishes three things. He said, one, the person receiving the note feels good about it. Two, we feel good having written the note and sent it to a, a relationship. And then three, the person that gets the note becomes a friend. And I, I'll tell you, uh, I've got a great Greg Hatcher story because uh, um, he, he lives and breathes what he, what he talks about. So this has been years ago, but we, we lived in Memphis and Greg was over in Arkansas, and there was a horrible ice storm that hit Memphis. And he was one of the first people to call us and check and make sure me and my wife and then my other two sales reps and their wives were okay. And he said, look, we had no power, right? We were out without power for the weekend. And Greg said, he goes, hey, I've got a lake house. I'm not going to be there. It's got heat. It's got, it's got red wine, and it's got a fireplace. He goes, why don't you guys just pack everything up, get out of Memphis, and come to the lake house? 
And so we, we, we took, up, uh, took him up on his offer. So we went over to Arkansas, spent the weekend at the lake house. When we heard power came back on in Memphis, obviously we came back and packed up and came back to Memphis. Well, I was kind enough. I just wrote him a nice thank you note. That's all. We, he didn't ask for anything. I just wrote him a nice thank you note. And I said, you know, Greg, hey, thanks so much for letting us to the lake house. You know, it changed our weekend. We, had, and then we, we got to have the best weekend, just the six of us over there in, over there in Arkansas. So Greg, in his office, has every single handwritten thank you note that you've, he's, he's ever received lines the walls of his office. It is absolutely the most amazing thing I've ever seen. You walk into his office, there's handwritten notes all over the walls. You walk down the hallway, floor to ceiling notes. He's got, so they're from the governor of Arkansas and Bill Clinton and you know, different, different dignitaries and people and clients and customers. I walk down the hall, the, la the next time I was in the office, I look up and he's got my note that I thanked him from a few years ago from the lake house on the wall. I mean, it is just truly amazing. The other important thing with, 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 with notes is that you cannot bond through email and texting. And I'll give you a case in point. I mean, email is a great communication device, right? It's great for me to say, hey, Colby, Matt, I'm going to be there at 1.30, right? It's a great communication device. But you can't bond. It's not a personal relationship. It's not a bonding method. And you just can't do that through, I found you can't do that through text and email. It's, it's a great communication device, but you can't bond. It is a supplement when you have a strong relationship. And again, case in point that was kind of a light bulb for me was I was just recently emailing back and forth to a client about my Titans tickets. And so sent an email over and said, hey, I've got two Titans tickets and got a note back. And they said, hey, um, let me check my schedule. Got to check with my, my wife. And, um, you know, let me see if we'd love to go. I'd love to take you up on it. I sent a note back, an email back a couple days later. I said, I haven't heard from you. And, and he, said, he came back and said, um, uh, um, you know, hey, I'm still checking with my wife. I'll, I'll let you know. A couple days later, I send another email back, and I'm thinking, hey, we've got a really good rapport here. We're, at least we're communicating back and forth. Another email comes back, and he said, uh, the, though it was from, from him, from his email account, but it was his, his assistant. And it said, hey, David would love the tickets, right? Um, thank you, Ben, so much. I really appreciate He really appreciates it. You know, let us, let us know how we can get the tickets, right? So think about that. I'm emailing with David back and forth, right? And I'm thinking I'm talking to David. <laughs> I'm thinking, hey, we've got a little bit of a bond going here. It's a, it's a prospect client of mine. And the whole time I'm emailing, emailing with his assistant, even though it's his email address, right? So there's no bond there. There's no relationship, relationship building there, right? And, and then I always use this as an example. What if I had sent an off-color joke, right? Or what if I had put, I'd sent a meme or something to that, to that email account as a, as, a, as, a, as a business person, thinking that it was him, right? And then it turns out to be his assistant, right? So you just can't bond with email. It's just a great supplement with, when, when you have a strong relationship. So one of the things that I've done that I've found to be very powerful is that every Friday and every Monday, I write notes to people. And I write notes to the people that I've met that week. I write notes to clients and customers if something's come up. And I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I've had these note cards made up, and I write 500 notes a year. And the reason I know that is that about July, I order 250 in January, and at about July, I have to have my assistant order another 250. <laughs> and then about January, I have to order another 250. So I know that on, on the course of a year, I write 500 notes a year. And this is, and, and, and we'll talk about the, the, this as well. It, you know, a lot of times people go, well, I don't have time to do it, or, or, you know, or I don't even know what to say, or you know, I run out of things to say. This is a typical note that I would write, Colby. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at MTSU last week. Here's to a great finish to 2018. All my best, Ben. Right? Some of, the, some of the best notes don't have to be long notes. It's just the gesture and the time that you took to write the note. Um, the other thing with notes is I can't tell you how many times I've walked in to someone's office, to someone's home, um, their cubicle, and a note that I've written to them is pinned up to the wall. It's because no one does it. Right? So you, you're going to stand out by doing this. Um, I was fortunate enough, my, one of my friends is the CEO of Tom's Shoes. His name is Blake Mikoski. And we were fortunate over spring break to tour the Tom's headquarters in Los Angeles. I wrote him a note and, and sent him a note and said, hey, thank you for allowing us to do this. It was a great experience just to see the Tom's headquarters and everything that they're doing with the one for one. And I, I sent him a thank you note for the tour. I sent him a copy of my book. And Blake, the CEO of Tom's Shoes, right, $600 million company, took the time to write me a thank you note back for the book. And he says he looks forward to reading it. And I've got that pinned on my desk at the office. 
right? I don't have too many handwritten notes because I don't get that many. But the, you know, that, that's a perfect example of this. There's a CEO at, at a major corporation that's taking time to write the notes. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about interviewing here in this, in this, in this same vein, because this is very important, because you guys are going to be graduating, you're going to be looking for jobs, going to be interviewing and whatnot. I shared this with Colby. Um, I shared this with Colby just actually a, a couple weeks ago when we were talking about topics and how, what I, the chapters that I was going to pull. And we're going to talk about being on time and, as well. I, my, the past five interviews, the past five people that I've interviewed were late for the interview and didn't follow up with not only a handwritten note but an email. Did not thank me for the time. And that is just unacceptable. I mean, it's just unacceptable, right? I mean, when you, you, number one, we'll, we'll talk about being on time and the importance of that. But the fact that the five people that I took the time out of my day to interview, and this is someone that's coming, that may come work for me and my team, was late and then didn't thank me for the time. I mean, I wouldn't consider, they wouldn't, I don't care what your GPA is or where you went to school, those individuals would never make it, they wouldn't make it past the, the, the you know, they wouldn't make it past go with me, you know, in my team. Our, we, we hold ourselves to a higher standard. So I... Uh, again, I'm not going to tell you what to do, <laughs> but in my experience, if you truly care about the job that you're interviewing for, to me, I look at the people that take the time. Well, number one, they're on time for the interview, but they follow up with a handwritten note to me. That is everything to me. I mean, just everything. That they've taken the time to do that. That shows to me that they're really interested in the job. They're interested in their career, and they care about the time that they spent with me. So here's just some, again, we'll, we'll, we'll get off, I'll get off my, my, my note soapbox, but um, the, uh, here's just some things, because people also look at me and they say, well, we don't, I don't know what to, you know, I don't know what to say, or I don't know what to do, or write. You can, you know, I always write, when I meet someone new, I keep their business card, and that's the first note I write. I, I, I just write a note, hey, here's my contact information, it was great to meet you. You know, thank a client for their business, obviously birthdays, holidays, sympathy, anniversaries. Um, thank you for all you do for, for, for my organization. Um, great time to remind people products and ideas. So if, what, no matter what you're selling or what your company does, it's a great chance to, to, to remind people of that. Um, congratulations, right? Um, could be the birth of a, um, of a baby. It could be um, you know, a promotion. Um, I scan the Nashville Business Journal every week, and I also look at like Nashville Lifestyles magazines and some of the social magazines. And if I see a client or a friend, I clip that out and send them a nice note. You know, write them a note and say, hey, I saw this. You, you may not have seen this uh, article. It was great. Um, or just to say hello. One of, the, one of the things that I do internally with my team, if I know that I'm going to be out of town, and let's just say I'm leaving for spring break or what it is, no, or it may, be, it may be vacation or business, the night before I leave, I will write five to six notes and leave them on certain people's desks so that even though I'm not in the office, they'll hear from me that next morning. And I can't tell you how powerful that is. Any thoughts there before we move on? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, comments? Would sending, like, happy anniversary for you and your wife or spouse, would that be too personal? No. It's, I, there's, I don't think you could be, you can't, you, yeah, you can't, you, you can't be too personal. Okay. Yep. I think it's, it's just very powerful. So, <coughs> all right. So, two more people. I need you to write down two family members that, that are the closest, which you would argue that are the closest relationship you have. We talked about two friends. Now, you're, now you're, it could be your brother, your mom, it could be a grandfather, whatever. You're two, you're two family members that are, are close relationships. And I'm not asking you to rank people, just two that, you, two that, you, uh, that are important relationships to you. All right, so one of, the, one of the chapters in my book is about giving back and just charitable giving and just giving back to the community in your time. And so I, it's called the $40 glass of lemonade. So I'm just going to talk briefly about this. Just, it has been so, giving back to a charity and working with charitable organizations for my organization, for Aon, and for me and my family, it's just been, and, and my clients and customers, it has been invaluable. And so I talk about the $40 glass of lemonade. It was the most expensive glass of lemonade that I ever purchased. And it was back in 1995, and it was at a Make-A-Wish golf tournament. And we were making the turn. So we played the nine holes. We were making the turn, and there was a lemonade stand. So we pulled up in the cart, and there were some kids and moms, and they're selling lemonade. And so I'm just thinking I'm going up and going to, you know, buy a glass of lemonade. And as I get up there, there's a young man named Danny. And, I, I, you know, 
didn't know him, didn't know his mom, and what I didn't realize is that Danny was a Make-A-Wish kid, and he'd already been to Disney World, right? He had a life-threatening illness. He'd been to Disney World with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, but he's back at the golf tournament raising money so that other kids could have the experience that he had. And when I asked him, I said, what are you doing here? And he, um, he said, well, I've been to Disney World, Mr. Hamback, and I'm, I'm, I want other kids to experience what me and my family did, and I'm raising money for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So two things happened that day. <laughs> I spent $40 on a glass of lemonade. <laughs> I put every dime I had in my wallet. I put that $40 in the, into the jar, right? And I, I came to a realization as a person and as a businessman that if this little kid can raise money for a charitable organization, just think of what I could do as, a, as, a, as an adult and as a business person. And so that was the day that I decided to give back. And um, this is one of my favorite quotes. I used this in a speech just back in March, and it's Danny Thomas. He's founded, anybody know who, he's the actor. I know where I'm going to date you guys, but he founded a St. Jude's Hospital down in Memphis. And so he's a famous actor and a philanthropist. And he said, success has nothing to do with what you gain in life or accomplish for yourself. It's what you do for others. And it's one of my favorite quotes. Um, I, I recently was at a breakfast, and um, I say recently, a couple years ago, and this was back, Carl Dean's last year as mayor. And when he got up and spoke to our group, I'll never forget what he said. He just said, Nashville in Middle Tennessee is one of the most philanthropic areas in America. I mean, it is absolutely, I mean, we are such a giving community, a giving town. You could go to a charity event any given night. You know, Preds Foundation is always raising money for, for if the hockey fights cancer night. There's, I mean, our, our community is one of the most philanthropic and giving communities that, that, that I've, I've ever been exposed to. Um, and so um, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can give back. But before I do that, I'm going to come back to the, um, come back to the, the Friends of Ben story. So I, um, I, I volunteered for the Make-A-Wish Make Foundation, and uh, my wife became a wish granter. And so we worked when we lived down in Memphis for Make-A-Wish, and then we moved to Nashville. And when we got up here, we found out that we, we wanted to jump right into the, to the uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation and found out there wasn't a chapter here. So fast forward a couple of years, we helped... Um, or I helped bring the Make-A-Wish Foundation here to Middle Tennessee. There were only a few areas of the country where Make-A-Wish wasn't represented, and, and Middle Tennessee was one of them. So I'm a founding board member with the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Um, I, got, I got on the board, and um, a couple years later, I was nominated to be board chair. Um, so I'm 28 years old. I'm board chair of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. I have no idea what I'm doing, right? I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. So um, a very close friend of mine and a client, his name was Jim Hunt, Jim was uh, board chair of the zoo. So I called Jim up and I said, uh, hey, can I spend, uh, can I buy you lunch or spend, spend the afternoon with you because I just want to pick your brain. And then basically I was asking for experience sharing, right? I wasn't asking for advice, but I'm like, I need some help. And so he brought me over to his office and um, we sat down and I'll never forget that afternoon because I was, I mean, I'm sitting here you know, at a young age chairing a large organization and trying to figure out how do I grow this organization, what do I do? And he, he gave me three experience sharing that afternoon that I'll never forget. The first one we already talked about, it was the FOBs. He said, Ben, you need to find five people that you can trust, surround yourself with those individuals, and count on them, and make sure they're people you can count on. And that has been invaluable to me. The second, sa the second thing he said was, um, he said, uh, you have to be passionate about the organization that you're, you're going to give back to. Like if, if you want to choose a charity, don't pull it out of the hat. Don't pull a charity out of the hat or an organization out of the hat. He said, you've got to be passionate about the cause and the mission. He goes, if you truly believe in helping kids grant wishes, you know, kids with, with critical illnesses go to Disney World and get their wish granted, he goes, that's for you. But if you don't believe in it, he says, you've got to find something else. You ha your heart has to be in it. And then the third thing he said, and that's why the giraffe is up there, it's my reminder, he said... <laughs> He said, when you go out to raise money in the community, he says, you have to raise money with the mission first. In other words, go out there and, and, and put the mission first and tell people why you're raising the money. Because there's too many, he said, there's too many organizations that, that, that go out there and they just raise money and no one knows where their dollar's going. Right? You, give, you give money to an organization, but you don't know where it's going. He said, always put your mission first. And his quote was, he said, we just raised a million dollars for the giraffe exhibit at the Nashville Zoo a million dollars. And he said, just think about what you could do for sick kids if we can raise money for a giraffe, right? He said, it's just the, the possibilities are endless. And those three pieces of advice have stuck, have stuck with me. 
and, and help me as I've continued to grow with the Make-A-Wish organization and other, other organizations that I've, I've given my time and money to. So, so I, I share this because it's been invaluable for me and I've, I've, I've incorporated my, my clients and my customers and my friends and my family in giving back to the community in all different ways. And so people always look at me and they're like, well, you know, hey, I'm a college kid or I just got my first job. I, you know, I, I, don't know, I don't know what I can do. You know, what can I do? I mean, you can give back in so many different ways. Obviously, time is money, right? You want to sort food at Second Harvest Food Bank. You want to volunteer. There are millions of things you can do in Middle Tennessee to give back with your time, and you don't have to write a check. As I mentioned, choose a I, it's so important to choose a cause that's close to your heart that you believe in, because if, you just, if, you, if your heart's not in it, then you're not going to be in it. Um, make sure you involve your friends and your family and your company. Um, can turn it, I, I've seen you know, kids all ages turn their birthday into a celebration or an event where you, instead of birthday presents, they give you know, a donation or, or a present back to a charity. You do something as simple as participate in a 5K walk, a run, or volunteer at your church. It's, it's really easy to do. And, and I'm fortunate enough, my, my organization, Aon, three times, and this is how important it is, Aon, three times a year, has what we call empowering communities. So three times a year, they allow us um, to take a half a day, and you gotta think about the payroll in my office and the payroll in our organization. So three half days to, to choose an organization and give back to the, to, the, to the community, which is very powerful. I'm very fortunate that our company allows us to do that. And so we, this, this past year, just to give you the example, we've partnered with the Second Harvest Food Bank, Make-A-Wish Foundation, and then the Tennessee Baptist Children's Home. So those were our three organizations that my office chose to, to give back to. So any, any thoughts there? Anybody don't, is giving back time, donating time, or a charity that's close to their heart? Anybody? It's a lot easier to tell the story and ask for a donation or ask for someone to play in a golf tournament when you truly believe. When I tell the $40 glass of lemonade story, it, that's, I mean, it gets, it's, 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 a, it's an easier story to tell. So, thank you, Colby. All right, last one. We're in the home stretch here. So now I need you to put down two relationships that are professional. So if you've got a part-time job, it could be your boss, it could be, uh, it could be Colby, it could be a professional professor in anything but a professional relationship we had friends first two were friends second two were family and now I need a professional relationship take a minute and, and think about that has anybody been on a job interview I know we I know we kind of has anybody been interviewed yet or spent any time interviewing how's that gone Okay. Good experience. I'm sorry, with? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I know, I know Anthony. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. He's, he's trying to hit us up for, for money, <laughs> for, for sponsorship. Well, he's thinking, he sees the, he sees the Man Manchester United sponsorship. He's like, well, hey, if we, <laughs> that was a $23 million sponsorship. He's like, you can't give us 50 grand? <laughs> so, oh, yeah. No, I, Anthony, I, I know Anthony very well. All right. We're going to keep moving on. We're in the home stretch here, about five, ten minutes. All right, I'm going to, again, I, this is a chapter in my book, and I know it's very simple, but it's about being on time. And uh, I, 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 the chapter of the book is called You're Late and You're Forgotten. And I cannot emphasize much, enough how important it is, or it has been important for me to be on time for appointments, for, for it could be anything for, as, as simple as a Titans game, you know, a, 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 an engagement like this, right? I mean, what, what, if, I, what if I'd walked in at, you know, quarter till? Right? And they're like, where's Ben? Where's the speaker? Right? It's just so important, and it's so simple, but it's so important to be on time. I was just recently in the airport with a bunch of guys, and there were six of us, and we were going up to a Cubs game. And so you get to the airport, right? Nobody rides together now, right? Everybody's valeting and Ubering and doing all this. We're all on our cell phones, right? We're all in a text thread, right? We've got two guys, that are, two guys that are in security, two guys are at the gate, two guys are going to get a coffee, right? And so I was sitting there, and I'm... And I'm as this is all transpiring and people are, you know, we're all excited about because we're going up to see the Cubs play. And I looked at my buddy and I just said, I go, what did we do before cell phones? And he looked at me and he said, you know what we did? He goes, we all showed up on time 
and we were at the gate. And, we, if we, and if we said, hey, we got, everybody's got to be at the gate at 7.30, that's where we were, right? But now everybody's running around like, you know, like chickens with their heads cut off and everybody's texting each other. And so there's a great, great quote by um, Woody Allen, the actor, and he said 80% 80, 80 of life is showing up, right? And I disagree. 80% of life is showing up on time. It, it is so important. Um, and I, I talk about out of, out of sight, out of mind. I think everybody's got that friend, and when I mention this, you're going to think of that person who, who is always habitually late, right? That person that's like, we're on Mark time, right? Or we're on Campbell time, or we're on Matt time, right? They're always late. And, it's, and, it, and you're, you're sitting around with your friends, and it's like, yep, here we go. They're late again, right? And so I've just never let that define me. It's so simple to be on time or be early. Just don't, you know, I've never, I never want anybody to go, well, Ben's late again. Here we go again, right? I don't want to be that person. And then, you know, use technology to your advantage. I, I've found that, you know, if I am running late, I mean, if I, if I was in a traffic jam or had a flat tire or something that was completely uncontrollable, out of my control, use your phone to, to send a message and let people know that you're going to be late. You know, I've done that before. Um, and then the 15 seconds is, uh, this, this is a, just a quick story about a, a insurance broker that I used to work with, and um, he, he, he was like, he goes, if you're going to, and, and, and this was before text messaging, so I'm going to date this a little bit, but his thing was 15 seconds. He, he's like, he would say, Ben, it takes 15 seconds to call someone and tell them you're going to be late, right? Just pick up the phone and let, them, let someone know you're going to be late. Sometimes it's okay, but just take the 15 seconds. And now with text messaging, it all it takes two seconds. And then also along the lines of, uh, along the lines of technology, um, set an alarm. I mean, if you think you're going to be so busy that you're going to get caught up that you're going to forget to check in for that flight or not be, you know, on time for a class or, or an appointment, set an alarm on your phone so that it reminds you 15 minutes before so you can get going. So uh, I, I think technology has made us a little bit crazier, but, but you can use it to your advantage to make sure you're, you're, you're doing the right things. And then the last thing, um, I just, I, I sometimes am just astounded. I use the example of the five people that, that I interviewed that, that were late. I mean, just being late is just disrespectful. Um, just recently, and I won't get into names because it's not, it's not fair, but just recently, a friend of mine and I drove to Chattanooga for a presentation similar to this. A little different, but similar to this. We drove from Nashville to Chattanooga, 180 miles. We had a time change, right? It goes from central to eastern time. We got to the hotel ballroom on time. I got up to speak, and as I was speaking, over the first 15 minutes of my, my, as I was addressing the group, people were still walking in. And these are the people that lived in Chattanooga. And all I could think about is how disrespectful is that to me and my friend who drove all the way from Nashville on time. And we made it on time. We're coming from Nashville, right? So it's, again, it's a matter of respect. And I've just found it's so important to be on time, be early for that, that matter, and, um, and, and just, just make sure that you're, you're respectful of your clients and your friends and your professors and whatnot. You know, the other thing is a great example today. I got here early because I'd never been here. And I used it as a chance to catch up on email. Right? So I got here at about 1.40, I called Matt, I sat down, I grabbed a water, and I, and I, I caught up on all the emails. Right? So you can use it to your advantage with technology. You get there early, it gives you a chance to, to prepare. So we talked about um, one, of the ch one of the chapters and one of the uh, things is the decision-making process. I can't tell you how many times I have friends and family and clients talk to me about, or come to me and say, I need your advice. <laughs> I've got this huge decision. I'm changing careers. Or I've got this huge decision, you know, um, I'm trying to figure out if I should buy this house or not or whatnot. And, you know, again, coming back to that gestalt protocol, I tend to, to shy away from giving people advice, right? Because the other thing that can happen is that if, if it's a bad decision or you give them bad advice, you know, they're going to blame you, right? So I, I, I like to share a little bit about my decision-making process and what's worked for me. Because um, you're going to come across tough decisions, decisions that you, you, you'll, you'll have decisions you have to make that are as simple as, um, you know, just as simple as, you know, do I go over to this person's house for Thanksgiving and as, and as career altering as do I, do I quit this job and take this opportunity, right? So there's going to be decisions in your life and I've, I've lived by these four guiding principles. The first one is trust your gut. It, for me, I can almost, when, when, when there's a decision to be made, I've just got that pit in my stomach and it's like, that just doesn't feel like the right decision to me. And I, I have found that eight out of 10 times, if it doesn't feel right, it's not the right decision. And so I've always just trusted my gut. I mean, it's just instinctually, it's been probably the best barometer, best guidance for me. Um, the other thing is, on the flip side of that, is get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Is because making a tough decision for me, or risk taking, you can throw it into that category, it's, it's tough. It's not, it's not an easy thing when you have to make a decision. 
whether it's, hey, I'm trying to figure out which college I'm going to, or, hey, I'm going to, like I said, <coughs> switch jobs, switch careers. It's, not the, it's, it's not, the, not the easiest thing in the world. So there is going to be that uncomfortable feeling, but you've got to get used to that. Um, and then there's the chief distractor. And I always go back to my high school English teacher, Miss Ruth Dunning, back in Germantown, Tennessee. And when we were prepping for the ACT class, I'll never forget there was the chief distractor. And she would say, when you're taking a test, right, you've got a multiple choice test, you've got four A, B, C, D, right? There's usually one correct answer, two wrong answers, and then the chief distractor. And the chief distractor is the answer that looks like it's the right one, but when you, when, you, when you start to work through the problem or work through the question, you know, it's not the right one, right? But it's the one that's meant to get you away from the right answer. And so in life and in decision-making process, I always, there's always a chief distractor. There's always going to be something that's pulling you away from the decision that you think maybe your gut's there. And I've always tried to eliminate the chief distractor and move forward. And then the last thing is, and I've got, I got some great experience sharing with this, was um, one of my close friends, you know, he said, hey, when I make a decision, I make it the right one. Right? Think about that. When I make a decision, I make it the right one, which is just never look back. Right? Just you don't ever look back. I, um, I, had a, um, I was talking to a candidate that was wanting to come work for our organization, and she was trying to decide between Aon and a competing organization. And she, she finally, she, she was, you could tell this was just tearing her apart. Right? It's a big career decision. Hey, do I go work for Ben and Aon, or do I go work for the competitor? And she called me. And I could tell this was tearing her up. She called me and she's like, Ben, I just don't know what to do, right? And I'm not going to tell her what to do, right? I just said, I said, look, I'm going, you, you really got, she, had, she really had two great opportunities, right? She's not going to lose either way. And I just told her, I said, make a decision and then make it the right one. So don't come and work for Aon and stare out the window wishing you'd gone there. And don't go over there and stare out the window and wish, you know, when you, when you make that decision, Make it the right one and put 100% of your effort into that decision. Because it, it, nine times out of 10, it's always worked for me where that's going to be that's going to be the right decision if you if you make it the right decision. So, and it's not always the case. But those are some of the things that I use. And there's a whole chapter in the book about just decision making process. All right, we're we're doing great on time, and we're, we're about a, like I said, about three or four minutes left. So, the last chapter in the book and the title of the book is called "Never Leave the Locker Room of the Super Bowl." And so, in 1996, um, it was Super Bowl 30. So you guys were all kids in diapers running around. <laughs> so it was the Cowboys and the Steelers. And so I was out there with a group of clients and friends. And uh, we managed, after the Cowboys beat the Steelers, to get down on the field. And after we got down on the field, we got passes to get into the locker room. And so here we are. There were eight of us. And we're in the locker room of the Super Bowl. And we were high-fiving Troy Aikman, high-fiving Deion Sanders, champagne being sprayed everywhere, right? At one point, this is as, as random as it is, true story, and I have no, this was no camera phones, no box phone, I have no proof of this, it's all up here, and then the, our, our, the stories that I, we tell. I was holding the Vince Lombardi trophy, someone handed it to me, and said, hey, can you hold on to this for a second, and they did something, and I ha held on to it, and I handed it back to them. I mean, when you talk about surreal, we were in the locker room of the Super Bowl, and <clears throat> at some point in time, about 35, 45 minutes into that, we as a group decided, hey, we need to catch up with the rest of our friends. We need to get out of here, right? We got to go. There's got to be a party. We got to get going. There's got to be something else. So we decide to leave. We walk down this long corridor. We walk down out this chain link fence. And we're standing in the parking lot behind Sun Devil Stadium in Phoenix, Arizona. And we're looking at each other. And we just said, what did we just do? We just left the best party ever. We, we walked out, right? I mean, what, what have we just done? So we have a phrase now, and we're going to talk a little bit about embracing the moment and staying in the moment. We have a phrase now when we're out at a bar or at a party or at someone's house and someone says, hey, let's go do this or hey, let's go check this out or whatever. We say, you don't leave the locker room of the Super Bowl. You know, live in the present moment. Don't get, don't, we, 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 we tend as people now to get so caught up in figuring out what the next best thing is. We're not, we're not taking it and embracing, you know, experiences and just in living in the moment. Um, so part of that, in that same vein, I talk about celebrating wins. Um, our, our team celebrates wins, and, and it could be as something as simple as you know, a, a new client, a new prospect. It could be something as a huge problem that's, that's, that's uh, festering, and we, we wind up getting, getting that handle. We love to celebrate wins, small or large. We recognize and reward. So if a team member 
Um, and, and when I say recognize and reward, we take the time to pause, stop, and recognize and reward our employees and our team, team members, because it's so important. Um, and then what I talk about, it's, it's, it's almost become part of my fabric and my fiber now is, is embracing experiences. You know, we love to have experiences with our clients, our customers, our teams. And I always say, you know, when I say life ha happens six inches up, life ha happens six inches up for your cell phone, right? So as, 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 as crazy it is with cell phones and our devices is try to put that stuff away. We, or we try to put that stuff away and we try to, you know, really enjoy each other and have our, have our, uh, have our, have our team uh, embrace experiences. Um, and then I'll, I'll leave you with this. There are a couple quotes that I, that I have come across just recently that I love. And it's, um, you know, I, I will tell people it's not what's being served at the meal, right? It's not, what's, it's not what we're having for dinner. It's the people around the table, right? It's just like my relationships with my clients, my customers, my friends and family have become the most important part of my life. And that's, what, that's just irreplaceable. It's not a text message. It's not an email. It's just those relationships that you build and the relationships that... Uh, you know, that, that, that are so important to you. So. Um, so now you should have, in closing, we're doing great on time, in closing, you should have six relationships written down. You should have two friends, two family, and two school, business, or whatever professional relationships you've got written down. So you've got one, one piece of homework from me. I have um, a stack of notes up here, and they are, it's a thank you note. It is, it's not sealed, it's open, and it's already got a stamp on it. So you don't have to buy the thank you note. You don't have to buy the stamp. I'm going to ask one thing of you guys as homework. I'm going to ask you to grab a couple of these and write two notes to two of those relationships that you guys wrote down. And I'd like you to do it today if you can. If you can't do it today, you do it in the next couple of days. And I promise you, if you do that, you will hear from that individual, and they will thank you for the, for the note. You will probably most likely see that note on their refrigerator, or on their office wall, or their cubicle. And I promise you, it will, pay, it will pay big dividends if you take the time to do that. Um, so I'll, I'll, this is my last quote. Is, is I use this when I toast and when I, we talk about friends and whatnot is, is that, um, and this falls back into the, to the locker room of the Super Bowl as well, is I tell people that your good friends know all your stories, right? All your good friends know your stories, but your great friends, they've lived them with you, right? It's those relationships that have been so important to me that count. So I'll leave that with you. So thank you guys for the time. Appreciate it. Hey, yeah. We really appreciate you being here. Oh, my pleasure. What not only great content, but what meaningful exercise for each of you to go back and think about the power of that one handwritten note. You got a question? Yep. Fire away. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Um, this is the first event I'm attending in this center, I think. This is so it's amazing content. Well, thank you very much. I'm so happy that um, I made it today. At the same time, I'm, I'm very angry why every single person on campus should be there. I mean, well, I, I, told, I told Colby, I'll come back. I, I would love to come back. It's so amazing content. Yep. That, yeah, it's so great. I would love to. I'm, I'm here to help. And you only got half of it today. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I just pulled six chapters that I thought you guys would find valuable. So. Well, um, Ben, ben is well respected in the community. Uh, he's well respected within the philanthropy circles. Uh, he certainly has my respect. Anyone that can build their own brand and then turn around and take an idea and turn it into reality and then monetize it and value it and have somebody else go, hey, we think that's so valuable, we'll pay you for it. And then to turn around, turn around and monetize that is, is a big deal. Yeah. And for then him to slow down and take enough time to put this information together and package it up in a way that's palatable. And then how masterful did he do that? Two, two, two. And then he takes all the roadblocks away for you and says, now, hey, here's how to go do it. And so part of success, part of success is taking one thing and being really, really good at it. And the thing that you'll know if you ever do spend time with Ben is Ben, not only does Ben write great handwritten notes, but everybody that works for Ben writes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Not by force, but <laughs> because I've gotten them, and I've gotten them, and that's one of the things that you uh, that you do very well. Yeah. So uh, you know, to me, um, the content is very practical. It's very useful. But the, the most compelling piece to me was was at the end when you say, "Hey, why did we walk out of there?" You know, and and you don't ever leave the locker room of the Super Bowl. 
What, what a great moment. And everyone in this room needs to be looking for that moment. Is there, and it, and it, yeah, they're, they're, they're all, they're, 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 it'll be Thanksgiving Day, right? It'll be a birthday. It'll be an anniversary. It'll be Saturday night with your friends, right? It's, like, it's, it's, when, you're, it's when you're embracing that experience and having that great time. You don't, don't let it end. And that, that's, that's kind of, the, it's, a met, it's a metaphor for, for making sure you're just living in the moment, living in the present moment. And, and while this is not yeah. <laughs> the locker room of the Super Bowl, this is Middle Tennessee State University. <laughs> we are at the Honors College. This is the Center for Student Coaching and Success. This is our first lecture in our lecture series, and we certainly appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was a bit